tutti alla presentazione finale del corso Workshop Innovative Systems. Oggi avremo appunto la presentazione finale del, del Workshop del 2022-2023. Inizio spiegando brevemente che cos'è il Workshop. Il Workshop è un corso essenzialmente a cavallo fra altri due corsi del eh, corso di laurea magistrale in Ingegneria Elettronica. In particolare del corso Sistemi Elettronici a Basso Consumo, tenuti, tenuto dal qui presente professor Maurizio Zamboni, e il corso Integrated System Technology del professor Gianluca Piccini. In questo eh, workshop alcuni studenti di questi due corsi eh, di ingegneria elettronica eh, partecipano e hanno la possibilità di portare avanti un progetto lungo eh, due semestri. Progetto che negli anni è cambiato molto, il, progetto, il workshop è partito eh, nel 2018 dove inizialmente si facevano architetture eh, per logic in memory sia da un punto di vista eh, architetturale sia da un punto di vista fisico, dopodiché si è passato eh, nel 2019-2020 a eh, un progetto legato alle reti neurali e successivamente abbiamo creato un nuovo tipo di workshop che prevedeva lo studio eh, proprio di architetture di elettronica digitale e in particolare dal 2020 ma soprattutto dal 2021 abbiamo iniziato a pensare a un workshop che mirava a creare un eh, microprocessore composto da diverse parti, da tutti i blocchetti elementari dell'elettronica digitale microprocessore che viene fatto sia da un punto di vista architetturale sia da un punto di vista del, del design fisico infatti il workshop vedremo brevemente diviso proprio in due parti dal 2020, nel 2021 sono stati ehm, costruiti i primi blocchetti elementari del, eh, di questo processore, 2021-2022 abbiamo iniziato a creare tutta una filosofia, tutta eh, una, un set di regole per creare il nostro processore, nel 2022-2023 abbiamo avuto ehm, essenzialmente quasi tutti i blocchetti elementari di questo processore, abbiamo iniziato a focalizzarci su alcune di queste architetture, in particolare eh, nel 2022-2023 ci siamo focalizzati sulle architetture eh, legate alla computazione logaritmica e alla computazione approssimata, che è appunto quella di quest'anno. Come, ehm, come è costituito il workshop? È diviso essenzialmente in due parti. Nella prima parte del workshop, che è quella più legata eh, al corso di sistemi elettronici a basso consumo, vi è inizialmente uno studio di letteratura di circuiti ari eh, aritmetici, dopodiché si parte eh, con la parte essenzialmente di, di design, sia eh, comportamentale sia per quel che riguarda eh, la sintesi del, del nostro microprocessore. Nella seconda parte del workshop invece ci focalizziamo sulla parte fisica, in particolare quest'anno abbiamo deciso di focalizzarci sul design eh, con carbon nanotube fat, quindi transistor basati su nanotubi di carbonio. E eh, novità di quest'anno abbiamo anche introdotto la parte di UPF, Unified Power Format, che appunto permette di eh, ottimizzare e gestire la potenza del nostro microcontrollore, il microprocessore. Quest'anno abbiamo avuto due gruppi, il primo gruppo composto da eh, William Baisi e eh, Valeria Piscopo che si è occupato della parte di computazione approssimata e il secondo gruppo composto da Ot Otman Laubibi e Marco Rausa che invece si sono eh, occupati della parte di computazione logaritmica. Eh, tutti insieme invece hanno eh, lavorato sulla seconda parte del workshop, quindi quella che riguardava l'implementazione su tecnologia Carbon Ant Fat e ehm, la parte di Unified Power Format. Ora vorrei passare la eh, parola ai gruppi, ma prima di fare questo inviterei il professor Maurizio Zamboni e il professor Gianluca Piccinini a fare eh, un saluto eh, per il workshop. Allora, eh, beh, mm, è una bella cosa essere qua per, per sentire e eh, capire tutto il lavoro che avete fatto. Eh, vorrei dire un'unica cosa, non come docente di sistema elettronico a basso consumo, percorso, ma più che altro eh, come coordinatore del collegio eh, che è subentrato a Gianluca Piccinini che ha fatto il coordinatore nei sei anni precedenti sull'importanza del workshop, sull'importanza del, del fare dei lavori multidisciplinari nel campo del progetto, cosa che a livello eh, tecnologico e non solo è importante 
è un qualche cosa che è molto apprezzato a livello industriale e quindi eh, sia questo che altri workshop eh, offerti al collegio eh, hanno un seguito a livello industriale, questo ci porta a dire che il, la strada è giusta, eh, sono molto contento appunto, e spero più che altro che abbiate in questo percorso che è stato lungo, faticoso, abbiate acquisito informazioni, modo di lavorare insieme, capire come affrontare i problemi e penso che questo sia uno dei risultati principali oltre ai risultati specifici del, del workshop. Io direi che è finito. Prego. Grazie Maurizio. Allora, eh, il fatto di venire secondo in questo caso mi facilita enormemente il compito perché ha detto probabilmente tutto quello che avrei voluto dire eh, io, quindi mi trovo ormai senza parole. Allora, tornando indietro, io ricordo quando a livello di, di, di collegio avevamo deciso di istituire questi workshop, eh, la strada non è stata sempre eh, lineare, sempre molto, molto facile, eh, per dei motivi che voi conoscete bene, siete molto carichi di lavoro, eh, il tempo che avete a disposizione per arrivare al, diciamo, alla laurea è per voi fondamentale, perché ovviamente volete essere inseriti il prima possibile nel mondo del lavoro e questo ovviamente ci crea dei vincoli eh, che qualche difficoltà hanno, eh, hanno creato. Eh, voi quest'anno avete coraggiosamente fatto questo workshop e quindi noi oggi sentiremo con piacere i risultati, però prima di tutto va il ringraziamento di tutte le persone che vi hanno seguito, da partire da Maria Grazia, Iuri e gli altri studenti di dottorato che in qualche modo si sono resi disponibili nell'aiutarvi in questa operazione, perché davvero, come diceva il professor Zambone, come diceva Maurizio, il workshop è un obiettivo importante, eh, parlavamo in questi giorni del piano strategico di dipartimento perché sono giornate così un po' eh, assoggettate a un certo numero di scadenze interne e notavamo che eh, come primo obiettivo strategico del dipartimento sulla didattica che è la prima missione del dipartimento ci sono proprio i workshop quindi l'importanza di questa attività secondo me è davvero molto grande e probabilmente dovremo fare molto per sollecitare un maggior numero di studenti a inserire diciamo nella propria carriera anche se come attività come dire addizionale eh, nel, nel piano formativo il workshop per i motivi che diceva Maurizio è fondamentale oggi avere una capacità di affrontare un progetto su più Fronti, quindi saper coniugare le capacità di progettazione digitale con delle competenze approfondite in ambito tecnologico e fisico. Quindi diciamo che il workshop di Innovative System ha questa ambizione e so che negli anni passati questa è stata perfettamente raggiunta e immagino che anche quest'anno questo obiettivo sia stato da parte vostra eh, raggiunto. Quindi con grande curiosità mi, mi, mi risiedo, vi ringrazio tantissimo e quindi vi lasciamo la parola. Grazie Iuri. Grazie. Allora, inviterei direttamente William qua a parlare. Adesso avremo le presentazioni dei, della parte aritmetica, quindi partiremo con la parte di eh, approssimata. approssimata e poi passeremo alla parte di logaritmica. E dopodiché ci sarà alcuni minuti per le domande e passeremo poi alla seconda parte del workshop. Io uso questo. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, my name is William Baisi. And I'm here to explain to you our uh, work on the approximate arithmetics. Um, the key idea of uh, the approximate arithmetic is to introduce uh, some error in our traditional uh, accurate uh, mm, arithmetic block in order to introduce the classical uh, um, benchmark of uh, the digital design, which are uh, the delay, the power consumption and uh, the area. And uh, it is uh, a very interesting um, uh, technique so, uh, in, uh, in many fields, uh, mainly a uh, field that has uh, uh, intrinsic uh, error inside, like uh, image and sound processing, or uh, algorithms that are uh, naturally resilient to uh, some uh, error, like uh, some algorithm in machine learning. Uh, we introduced some uh, error metrics, like uh, uh, the error rate, which is the error over the sample multiplied by 100, so it's percentage. Uh, the error distance, which is the absolute error distance between the correct value and the approximate value. Uh, the relative error distance, uh, 
uh, and the mean of uh, the error distance. And the one of the more important, uh, because it's one of uh, uh, which we use for evaluate um, the performance of uh, our block is the mean relative error distance. And uh, the last one is the normalized uh, error distance. Uh, now we can focus on the adder and the substructor block. Uh, so the, the key idea here is to divide uh, the adder in uh, one accurate part and one approximate part. And um, we can uh, modify uh, the true table of uh, the, the basic block of, of almost all the adder and substructor, which is the full adder, and uh, introduce some error in the, in the true table. And um, we, can do it, we have do, done it uh, in using as uh, approximate block uh, some uh, basic gate like uh, or gate ox or xor gate and uh, using a, a total novel uh, basic block which is the majority gate uh, and uh, we can do that uh, we have done that uh, with the majority gate on all the parallelism and uh, in uh, a subset of the parallelism uh, while uh, for the um, for the first one we have uh, used an accurate part and uh, varying the the approximate uh, part uh, width and uh, a, a very interesting feature is that uh, the error is tunable and uh, so you can fit it on uh, your algorithm and choose uh, uh, how much error you can introduce introduce um, and another uh, important one is uh, that the lower or part adder uh, which uh, has uh, or gate as uh, inaccurate part uh, has a zero bias error and so for a cumulative uh, algorithm it, it's an important feature uh, these are the, uh, our performance in terms of uh, uh, power delay and area with respect of uh, the last year uh, adder one other technique uh, is uh, the equal segmented adder. So we divide uh, the total bit width in a uh, different block and we don't propagate uh, the carry. So in, we reduce the total switching activity and we obtain very, very high speed. Uh, and uh, the last one is the truncation uh, that allow, uh, we simply truncate the LSB. Uh, so we obtain a low area and high speed. And uh, these are the, the results. And in terms of power delay, uh, we, are, we obtain better results, but we have uh, a larger error to take into account, to accept. And uh, here are the, um, the total comparison of uh, our architecture, our, our best architecture for each category. For integer adder, we choose the low or gate adder uh, with an uh, accurate uh, part um, designed in, with the uh, brand Kung network. And um, for the floating point, it's important to notice that uh, we, the starting point was the work of the past year workshop. So we, inter we introduce our integer uh, addition block in, uh, for the uh, sum of uh, the, the mantissa, but we keep correct uh, the, the exponent for uh, do not affect too much the, the total error. Uh, while while uh, for the multiplication, we investigate the broken array multiplier, uh, where we omit uh, in uh, vertical and horizontal direction some uh, compressor in the partial tree reduction. Um, yes, and uh, we in another one is to approximate uh, the approximate compressor multiplier, where again we simplify the, co the basic compressor. Uh, we don't omit them, but we reduce the total number of ga gate and. Um, and so we reduce the area and we obtain a better, better speed. Uh, the actual implementation of our architecture was the uh, error tolerant multiplier. And so again, the idea is to divide uh, in, um, in two parts, one accurate and one inaccurate, the total uh, bit width. And uh, the accurate one uh, use a, a correct multiplier, while the inaccurate uh, work in this way. Uh, we s choose a starting point between uh, M, a, a most significant bit and less significant bit. And we proceed uh, in the direction of the least significant bit. And whenever we uh, encounter a a one in the operand, we set all bit to one uh, till the LSB, and uh, we have uh, an example of a number that is of a, a 12 bit multiplication that is not general at all, but it can uh, tell us uh, that it can be good in some condition, um, and uh, we obtain a relative error distance of 1.5 percent uh, in, in this case. Uh, just an example, um, and another interesting feature is that in case of the most significant bit, our roll set to zero, 
uh, we have a, we use the accurate adder uh, for to not do not uh, affect too much the error on the small uh, bit uh, small number multiplication. And these are the results that are qu quite uh, interesting in terms of uh, integral multiplier and uh, floating point multiplier with respect to the um, accurate multiplier of the, past of the past year. And um, at the end of this uh, long trip, we, we build up our uh, entire ALU. And uh, these are the results in terms of area and in terms of power delay product. Uh, they seem quite good, but uh, we, we use a quite uh, aggressive technique. So we, we introduce a, 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 a high error for uh, see how much we can obtain from uh, this technique. But the result was uh, quite, uh, quite interesting. And uh, at the end, uh, just to word uh, on the, uh, this new, uh, new emerging technique, um, we add a new parameter that uh, is the error uh, inside our equation for the design, but we increase the, the total number uh, in the space of solution, the total, uh, um, the total uh, implementation that can fit our algorithm. So if we uh, choose uh, a number of errors that we can accept, uh, this is a, a very interesting technique, uh, keeping working the algorithm, and, uh, um, and uh, that's, uh, that's all. Um, now I, I leave the stage to my colleague and friend, uh, Marco. Thanks, William. I am Marco Ravusa from the Hybrid LNS group. And LNS is an acronym that stands for Logarithmic Number System. And the idea is to apply the logarithm to arithmetic operation um, in order to reduce their complexity. As we can see, the complexity of the multiplication and division is reduced because we transform them into addition and subtraction. However, as we will see later, the addition and subtraction operation are more complex. Another interesting property of the LNS system is uh, its intrinsic low power behavior. And this is because the logarithm can be seen as a compressor for values greater than one. And in this figure is reported the assertion probability, that is the probability of a bit to switch from zero to one in two cases. On the left side, we have a number on eight bits, while on the right side, we have a number on 12 bits. And these numbers are randomly generated using an uniform distribution. And because of this, the fixed point representation has a, an assertion probability of 0 0.25, and it is equal for all the bits. While for the LNS representation, we can observe a reduction of the assertion probability, uh, especially on the most significant bits. So this implies a lower uh, switching activity, and so a reduction of the dynamic power consumption. Addition and subtraction are more complex because of the presence of this uh, second term in the equation. That is a nonlinear function that depends on the difference between Ly and Lx. And assuming the Lx uh, value is greater than the Ly value, this difference is lower than zero. And because it is a nonlinear function, the idea is to precalculate their value and store it in a lookup table. Here is a report the basic architecture in, in uh, which we can see the presence of the ROM memory for storing the value of the phi function. And that is addressed by this uh, subtractor that calculates the parameter d. However, there are some problems. Uh, the first one is that we need uh, two different lookup tables, one for the addition and one for the subtraction, because they are two different functions. And, but the main problem is that, for example, on a 32-bit processor, uh, D is on 32-bit. And so uh, our, our lookup table needs to have 2 to the power 32 rows. That is a huge amount of memory. And so the solution is to interpolate this function. And this interpolation can be easily done in the addition. While for the subtraction, it is more difficult, especially in the range of the D between minus 1 and 0 because the phi function goes to minus infinity. The solution proposed in literature is to apply a range shift algorithm. And the idea is to transform the input values with, whose difference is between minus 1 and 0 with new input values with a difference lower than minus 1. 
and then come back to the previous result uh, using three other lookup tables that here are labeled P, F1, and F2. And with this architecture, we have that the addition and subtraction are seven times slower than uh, multiplication and division. We still have another problem to take into account because up to now we've considered a unit that takes uh, as input LX and LY, that are the logarithm of the input values. Uh, but this is not the case of a general processor, uh, general purpose processor in which data are typically stored in a fixed point or floating point representation. And so we need a unit that converts the input data into the LNS1. Uh, the most known algorithm is the Mitchell one. And assuming a number in the fixed point representation, we can express it as uh, 2 to the power of k, where k is the position of the most significant bit times one plus, and then we have this uh, summation that we can call x, and it represents the initial binary number without the most significant bit, because the upper bound is k minus one, shifted by k position to the right, and so it is a number between zero to one. And we can use this property when calculating the logarithm, because we can approximate the logarithm of one plus x with uh, its first order Taylor expansion. So the logarithm of y is composed by two parts, two parts, uh, the integer one, that is the position of the most significant bit, and the fractional one. Here is reported an, an example in which we convert the number 200, and the uh, most significant bit is on the seventh position, and so the in, uh, integer part of the logarithm represents the number seven, while for the fractional part, uh, it is the initial binary number without the most significant bit. This algorithm requires a low complexity hardware, but introduces an high error because of this uh, Taylor approximation. And uh, we can try to compensate it uh, in two ways. The first one is to store the logarithm of one plus x in a lookup table. And so this means that the uh, fractional part of the logarithm uh, is calculated by this lookup table addressed by the x value. Or we can store the error function. So uh, once the logarithm is computed, we take the fractional part that is responsible for the error in the output result. And then using a lookup table, we compensate it. So our uh, unit has three main problems. The first one is that uh, as, uh, the addition and subtraction operation are more complex. And, and so this limits the class of algorithm that can benefit of this unit. The second one is that we have a high number of lookup tables, so um, high uh, memory usage. And the third one is that we are underusing LNS representation because it can be demonstrated that on a 32-bit LNS re representation has a slightly large range with respect to the floating point one. And so if we try to convert a 32-bit fixed point representation into a 32-bit LNS representation, we are, we are using only a small part of the total range. How can we solve all this problem? Uh, to do so, we set some goals. The first one is that we want to use all the range of the LNS representation. The second one is that we want to reduce the complexity of the addition and subtraction. And the third one is that we want to reduce the number of lookup tables. And to do so, uh, the idea is to use a floating point as input values and an hybrid LNS unit. An hybrid LNS unit is a unit that can be seen as a floating point unit for the addition and subtraction and as a LNS unit for multiplication and division. So in case of multiplication and division, uh, in this case we need to convert the floating point input number into our LNS number, but this can be easily done using only one lookup table for the logarithm of x, with x between one and two, because we need only to convert the significant of the input number. Then the result in the LNS form uh, needs to be converted in, in a floating point one, and so, as we can see, the integer part of the LNS representation is the exponent of the floating point one, while the, uh, significant, for the, uh, the significant we need uh, one lookup table for the values of two to the power of x with x between zero and one. Also in this case, uh, to reduce the memory usage, we need to interpolate those functions. And we made available two possible interpolation. The first one is the linear interpolation. And as we can see, by increasing the size of the memory, increasing the parallelism of the address bus, we can uh, reduce uh, the error on the output result. So there is a trade-off between the uh, memory size and the error. And, but uh, at each conversion, the linear interpolation requires a multiplication to be done. 
And if, it, if we can accept an higher error on the output result, we can try to reduce the memory size and to eliminate this multiplier. And for this reason, we made available also the nearest neighbor interpolation. Here is a reported an example. And the idea is to um, approximate our logarithm, fu logarithm or exponential function with a step function. And so we need only to save these, uh, the values of the step function. But as we can see uh, from the tables, the error increases. Then we proceed to design our architecture and uh, trying to reduce the area and the leakage power. And to do so, uh, we shared all the operators among all the operations. But we need to pay attention because this um, architecture, because of the presence of the global bus, can uh, increase the dynamic power because an high effective capacitance on the bus and an high switching activity. Our biggest problem in the implementation of, of this unit that takes most of our time was about the ROM implementation because the 45 nanometer technology library does not have a model for a memory and also no memory compiler was available. So synthesis and further optimization on the design cannot be performed. At the beginning, we try uh, research for uh, open source software. The two most known are CACTI from Havelet Packard and OpenRAM. And CACTI uh, is uh, uh, an analytical tool for the estimation of access time, power, and cycle time of the cache memory. But because cache memory and more in general static RAMs are, are a lot different with respect to the ROM memories, this was not a good solution, and for the same reason, we discard the option to use OpenRAM, that is an open source uh, static RAM memory compiler. At the end, our idea was to create a simple masked ROM in the 45 nanometer technology, and then characterize it in, uh, using Virtuoso in terms of uh, delay and power and then uh, create a quick time model that is uh, a model used by design compiler to describe the timing of a black box and a black box is a unit that cannot be synthesized but thanks to this uh, QTM model the design compiler knows the timing of the input and output ports and so uh, it can synthesize the, all the surrounded logic However, this two last uh, step failed because of the presence in the problem of the generation of QTM model that requires the presence of, the mil of a Milky Way libraries for this uh, black box. So in conclusion, because of these technical issues in the ROM implementation, we are not able to fully synthesize our architecture. And so to obtain valid, valid result, optimize the architecture and compare the result with the previous uh, result of the previous year. And, but we think that the LNS unit can uh, increase the performances, especially in computer graphics and neural network fields, because as we can see, uh, as, we, as we have seen in the previous slide, it speed up the multiplication and division operation. Thanks for uh, your attention, and we are available for uh, answering to your question. Uh, good afternoon, ev everybody. Uh, in this part of the workshop, um, we um, uh, was dedicated uh, in particular to the study of the carbon nanotube uh, field effect transistor technology and uh, the benefits of this um, technology in, the, in digital circuits. Uh, this study was carried on following uh, these steps. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, we started with a, a study in literature of, um, um, of the state of the art of uh, the carbon uh, nanotechnology. Uh, then we uh, characterized a model uh, using uh, Cadence Virtuoso. Uh, after that, we developed and uh, characterized our own library of gates. Uh, and in the end, we uh, synthesized uh, a simple uh, architecture in using uh, our library in order to understand the, the benefits of this uh, architect of this uh, technology uh, the carbon nanotube uh, is essentially a, a sheet uh, or are, are essentially a sheet of graphene that is rolled into uh, cylinders of uh, diameter ranging from one to two nanometers 
uh, and due to this um, property of ultra thin body they possess a high electrostatic control over the channel uh, moreover the short channel effects are very small uh, and uh, they uh, permit uh, they allow uh, further scaling even for uh, gate length that is smaller than 10 nanometer um, they, are, uh, they are also very highly uh, energy efficient uh, because of their high uh, carrier velocity uh, and for all these reasons they are one of the most promising technology uh, in order to increase the performances of low operating voltage uh, ap applications. Uh, we uh, we used the virtual source carbon nanotube uh, FET model developed by uh, the University of Stanford, uh, and uh, this is a semi-empirical model. Uh, it is implemented in Verilog A, and it describes the main electrical quantities of uh, this device uh, and how. Um, and uh, it also includes uh, all the most important parasitic elements of uh, the device and how these are affect affected by uh, dimensional scaling. Um, um, and the results of this model uh, reflects the experimental observation. Uh, moreover, uh, P-type and N-type transistor are uh, completely symmetrical because of the symmetry between uh, conduction and the valence band in the um, carbon nanotubes. Uh, this model has many parameters to be tuned uh, for different applications. Uh, the most important of them are the gate length, the contact length, uh, the diameter of the carbon nanotubes, and uh, the thickness of the oxide, um, and the spacing between the carbon nanotubes. Uh, for the gate uh, thickness and the, the pitch length, we decided to let the, the val default values of the model, uh, since those uh, were related to uh, a physical device that was realized and experimentally tested. Uh. Uh, at this at this point, we decided to perform a characterization over different parameters of the model. Uh, in particular, here we can see uh, a parametric analysis uh, that was run uh, on the diameter and how these affect the, the drain current of, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the transistor. Uh, we can see, in particular, that uh, the ion current. Uh, is uh, increasing with the, the diameter, and this is mainly due to the um, fact that the energy gap is uh, um, is uh, inversely proportional to the diameter. Uh, however, we can see that the I of current increases uh, very fast, um, and uh, in fact, only the, the first four curves, that are the ones related to one. Uh, 1.1 and 1.2 and 1.3 uh, nanometers. Uh, are uh, respect the the value, the requirements of um, IRDS for the 2023 year. Uh, here, instead, we can see the uh, the effect of the carbon nanotube density uh, in a single device. We can see that also here we have more or less the same effect, uh, except that for the I of current is uh, uh, is increasing uh, more slowly than the last case. Uh, we can see here that uh, except the first uh, curve, the blue one that is related to uh, a, a device with only a single uh, carbon nanotube, all the others are uh, accepted according to the IRDS. Uh, however, uh, we know that uh, the ion current uh, is related to the delay of the device, and the I of current is related to the, um, to the leakage of the, the device. And so, um, a uh, trade-off needs to be performed uh, according to different applications. Uh, here we performed a high performance optimization uh, on the various parameters. Uh, we can see in particular that for the diameter we choose the, this value of 1.2 nanometer and this is the one uh, that, uh, uh, that gives us a, a lower value for the short term effects. Uh, for the density, we choose this value of 180 uh, carbon nanotubes uh, for the same reason. Uh, as a result, we can see that uh, the ion I of uh, current ratio is of the order of 10 to the 5, that is a uh, quite good uh, value. Uh, 
Uh, after that, we performed a uh, low power optimization. Um, we can see uh, that here that uh, also here that uh, the only parameter that changes uh, uh, is basically the, the carbon nanotube density, uh, which in this case is of the order of 100 um, carbon nanotubes per micrometer. Uh, we can see that the ion and the ion current uh, decreases uh, too much. Uh, however, they are still uh, above the thresholds of the IRDS. Um, for the ion IO current ratio is of the order of 10 to 7. This is also uh, here uh, a quite good result. Uh, here we can see a comparison between the carbon nanotube uh, devices and the um, 45 nanometer transistors. Uh, we can see that there is an improvement of one order of magnitude uh, in the uh, ion IO uh, current ratio, both for the high speed device and for low power one. Uh, also, the uh, short channel effects are very low, and uh, we can see that also the subthreshold slope is uh, very small in the carbon nanotube technology. Uh, and we can see that they are quite close to the theoretical limit of around 59 uh, millivolt per decade. Uh, after this step of uh, transistor characterization, we pass to the library development phase. Uh, where we uh, exploited uh, an existing template and uh, spice, spice netlist of the 15 nanometer library uh, using uh, Python and Bash scripts in order to develop our own gates. Um, uh, after that, do, those, um, those um, gates were tested uh, using Cadence Virtuoso in order to be sure that uh, uh, they are working correctly. Uh, after that, we um, uh, we set the characterization conditions for different gates, uh, and in the end, we performed the characterization using the libraries. Uh, and uh, the result of, uh, of the liberate was uh, then transformed to a point DB file that, that is used in the next step for the synthesis of, uh, digital, uh, of our digital designs. Uh, for deliberate char uh, characterization, uh, we uh, need uh, essentially two files that are the char point TCL and template point TCL. Uh, the first one is uh, necessary to set the operation conditions of, um, uh, of uh, the gates, and uh, it also provides the transistor model to the, um, to, uh, the external simulator that is a spectre right, in this case. Uh, for uh, template uh, point TCL, it, it is necessary in order to set the operating conditions of the um, of the cells uh, uh, as the inputs lose and the, the outputs lose. Uh, in the end, we use the, this library uh, validation tool uh, available in uh, Liberate. That is uh, what this is used to uh, um, to compare our library to the 45 nanometer library gates. Uh, the comparison uh, gives us uh, um, that uh, there was a reduction of the leakage power of 78 uh, percent. This is a quite good result. Uh, however, the delay comparison uh, reported a, a high number of outlier values. Uh, which indicates that the comparison is not reliable. And this is due to many reasons. Uh, the most important uh, one of them is that the 45 nanometer is characterized using uh, 1.2 volt, uh, while the carbon nanotube, uh, for the carbon nanotube, is not possible to, to do this, this uh, characterization because the ion <coughs> of uh, current ratio is uh, of the order of 10 to 3, that is too small value for to be used. Uh, in the end, we perform a synthesis of a simple architecture uh, that will be explained more, uh, more in detail by my colleague in the next step, but uh, it essentially consists of one uh, floating point adder and uh, one uh, logarithmic uh, number system multiplier uh, and um, a power management unit that is necessary to generate the UPF commands. Uh, actually, the, the library we used for the synthesis was a mixed version of the, our library and the 90 nanometer one uh, because uh, we didn't have the uh, cells related to the memory. Uh, the results are very, uh, very good, uh, very interesting. Um, 
for example, we can see that there is a reduction of the delay of one order of magnitude uh, with respect to the 90 nanometer one. Uh, also, switching power and leakage power, there is a huge reduction of about one order of magnitude uh, with respect to the 90 nanometer one. In conclusion, uh, we can see that the, the results uh, were very promising. Uh, and carbon nanotube, in fact, uh, the carbon nanotube uh, technology is uh, one of the most promising technology for the next decade uh, to complement silicon and extend CMOS technology uh, in the sub 10 nanometer nodes. Uh, however, there are still many issues uh, essentially related to fabrication and uh, uh, and uh, simulation uh, that, that are still uh, still. Uh, going on in the research field. Thanks for your attention and now we'll pass the word to my colleague. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I will now proceed to present the last part of the workshop which is centered on the unified power format. So uh, the unified power format is a published IEEE standard uh, which is um, used to define um, the power intent of a circuit. As a matter of fact, we usually um, exploit RTL description for the functional specifications, whereas uh, to the power behavior, we need a different tool, and that is the UPF. Um, we have different components that uh, are available. Are available. Uh, first of all, we need to group together all the elements that uh, work together in the same way for what concerns uh, the power aspects. So, um, and these are called power domains. Uh, and all the possible states in which a power domain um, is allowed to work are summed up in a power state table. Then, of course, we need uh, a power supply network, which includes power sets, power ports, but also power gates, uh, which are very important because they allow us to uh, implement power uh, gating technique, so connect or disconnect a certain power domain from the supply rail. And then we have uh, a series of um, cells like isolation cells and level shifters, that uh, allow us to make the circuit actually work with different supply voltages. And then uh, we may also exploit retention strategies to choose um, different data that we might uh, still want to keep if the main supply voltage is down. Uh, so how the UPF is actually implemented? First of all, of course, we need the RTL description of our circuit. And, um, but this time we need to leave some floating ports uh, that will be used by the UPF elements during synthesis by, for example, the power switch is enabled. Then we can proceed with the power aware simulation. So um, along with the normal RTL um, description, we need the TCL file with the UPF directives. And a system burial test bench might be quite useful because it allows us to implement additional UPF functions. And then, of course, we need some uh, attributes uh, to tell the simulator to actually perform the power aware simulation. And if everything is done correctly, uh, the simulator will provide us with information about uh, the actual power state of the circuit. Then we can proceed with the synthesis with the UPF uh, TCL file directives. And along with the normal RTL libraries, we need um, additional uh, UPF libraries containing all the cells I mentioned before. And in this way, we will generate a netlist that uh, we will contain power pins and uh, can be used for the post synthesis power aware simulation and for the final step, which is the back annotation to uh, estimate more precisely the power. And uh, this is performed in the usual way, but it's very important to keep the hierarchy path of the of our circuit in order to respect the different power domains. And to do so, we just need to add a couple of comments in the simulator and the uh, supercenter. So uh, we implemented our architecture, which is actually very simple. It's just composed by um, an approximate logic additional subtractor and a logarithmic logic multiplier divider, both working in floating point. And they were developed in the first part of the workshop. And uh, with an opcode, we decide which operation we can do. And then we need the power management unit in order to control all the signals needed by the UPF elements. So the enables, for example, for the isolation cells and power switches. And the basic idea is to have uh, the multiplier and the structure work in um, two different modes. 
the low power mode with a lower supply voltage and the high speed mode with a higher supply <coughs> voltage. And uh, when one is working, the other is turned off. And we can also have a sleep mode where everything is turned off, uh, except for the backup supply voltage, of course. So um, we, we tested and synthesized our architecture. And here is the result. We can see different power domains, one for the other and the other for the multiplier, and the third one is used for the memories needed by the multiplier. And here also we can see different elements I mentioned before, like power switches, uh, isolation cells, and level shifter of the interfaces of the power domains. So here we present, first of all, the results without the backup notation, and um, we can see uh, that uh, with the UPF uh, there is a high uh, power saving, uh, in this case, we just fixed the, the voltage at the synthesis time of the other and the multiplier in, uh, in low power case with a lower supply voltage, a high speed with a higher supply voltage. And you can see that the higher savings are in terms of leakage because, of course, we reduced the supply voltage. And by doing so, we also forced the synthesizer to use high threshold voltage cells. So we have a even more, uh, even higher savings. And then we perform the um, uh, back annotation process. First of all, we have to say that uh, our library couldn't allow us to also um, exploit the SDF file. So the results may not be really completely reliable. But still, we can see that uh, after the back annotation with 1,000 uh, both random additions or random operations, we have an increase of power in the case of the UPF elements actually working. And this is due to the fact that uh, the switching power and the internal power increase. And this is very important because uh, when we applied the UPF, we thought about it uh, in a more didactic way. So basically, we just wanted to test uh, the UPF elements. But of course, the switching power must be taken into account. And so switching on and off continuously uh, elements might uh, affect in a negative way the total power. So the UPF is a very important tool that um, can bring us quite high savings in terms of power, but we also need to take into account the trade-off uh, between power savings and, of course, higher area due to the, all the additional UPF cells and the switching activity of turning on and off uh, different components of the circuit. So thank you for your attention, and if there are any questions, we're here.